tonight on First Tuesday. I felt as a physician I must always come down on the side of life. I think that's wrong. A doctor's dilemma over a rare blindness in premature babies. We'd like you to uh, greet our international press. An outing to Liverpool for the ladies and gentlemen of the Foreign Press Corps. And having a job is really beautiful. It just makes me happy. And the life story of a washroom attendant in Chicago. Good evening and welcome to First Tuesday. I imagine that most of us share that sense of wonder when one of those minute and fragile babies that weigh only two or three pounds at birth struggle through the first few precarious days of life to become healthy infants. Of course, with modern skills and new technology, such wonders are almost commonplace. Unhappily, though, some of those babies are at risk and things can go wrong. In our first film, Blind Faith, Miriam Stoppard reports on some such cases and the medical and moral dilemmas they pose. We just, we just told the lab we're getting one. Mm -hmm. At a centre for the disabled near San Francisco, four young blind people are preparing for one of the most extraordinary experiences of their lives. It's kind of a high step okay. here, Cindy. I can make it. Can oh, make they it? Are. Mm -hmm. Got it? Started. Uh, there you go. Oh. Each of them is blind, because of a medical mistake made a generation ago when they were tiny premature babies. Now they're on their way to a unit similar to those in which they lost their sight. Their condition is known as retrolental fibroplasia, RLF for short. How they came to have it is a lesson in medical history most doctors would prefer to forget but which this doctor, Bill Silverman, is determined must never be forgotten. Bill Silverman is one of the world's greatest experts in the care of newborn babies. But pride in his achievements has for many years been overshadowed by the spectre of RLF and its victims. The history of the past, particularly in this disorder, particularly in the care of premature infants, is just littered with disaster after disaster. It is not necessary when a new a treatment uh, is uh, proposed in the care of premature infants to blind 10,000 infants. But that is precisely what happened with retrolental fibroplasia. It all began 3,000 miles from the Pacific shoreline. For Bill Silverman, it's a journey back through time. Good morning, sir. Good San Francisco Airport, please. Thank you. The story began one February morning in 1941 in Boston when a good friend of mine by the name of Stu Clifford made a routine house call to examine a infant that had been born three months earlier. The examination was uh, perfectly normal until he examined the eyes when he noticed that the eyes were wandering in a very strange fashion and as he looked more closely it was clear that this baby was blind. Over the next five years, 117 examples of an entirely new kind of blindness of young infants were described. What the eye doctors found strange and what they had never seen before was that the very small blood vessels of the retina, the back layer of the eye, were growing in a very disordered way, in a wild proliferation and hemorrhaging, which occurred in the retina, destroying the retina, forming a dense scar so that vision was then obliterated. And this condition became known as retrolental fibroplasia, or RLF for short. Silverman's destination is New York City and the prestigious Columbia University Medical Center. 
35 years ago, at the height of the blindness epidemic, he was in charge of the premature intensive care unit here. Today, the unit is run by one of his former students, Dr. John Driscoll. John. Hi, Dr. Silverman. Good How are you? Good to see you. It's a far cry from the old unit, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, your brother. It's a culture shock. I think that's the only way. <laughs> the technology may have changed, but the needs of premature babies have not. Weighing as little as one pound at birth, it requires enormous efforts by doctors and nurses if they're to survive. Their intestines and lungs are often imperfectly formed and they need special feeding and help with their breathing. Back in the 1940s, the saving of such fragile lives was a medical wonder to place alongside new miracle drugs. And it was with unconcealed alarm that doctors saw the epidemic of baby blindness spread throughout America, Britain, Europe and Australia. The cause had to lie in some new factor in care or conditions. Many theories were put forward, but one by one they were rejected. Then, ten years into the epidemic, attention began to focus on the one thing thought to be above suspicion. High concentrations of oxygen had been given to premature babies for years. With their immature lungs, it helped avoid brain damage caused by low oxygen levels in the blood. But new airtight incubators ensured higher concentrations than ever before. The evidence was strong enough for leading American doctors to agree to an unprecedented scientific trial. Eighteen hospitals, including Silverman's own, undertook to register each new premature baby with a coordinating center in Detroit. Back would come a cable assigning the child to either routine or restricted oxygen. In the routine group, babies were given high concentrations of oxygen for one month. Those in the restricted group were given oxygen only when absolutely necessary. After a year, the doctors met again to consider the results. And this was the first time as they put that slide up on the screen uh, showing that the infants who received routine oxygen uh, was 23%. And the restricted group, the one that we were so fearful of, the incidence was 7%. And it was a dramatic moment. Mm. The oxygen debate was over. That indeed the risk was greater in infants who were in high oxygen. And uh, that was that. And this disorder, which by this time was the commonest cause of blindness in preschool children, mm -hmm. virtually disappeared. Here, uh, Britain, uh, Canada, I mean, uh, articles were published, you know, showing the rise and fall. End of story. But the story did not end. Although RLF virtually disappeared during the 50s and 60s, Babies like this are now once more at risk, and the numbers of blinded approach those of the epidemic years. This baby girl, 12 weeks premature, has been flown 200 miles to hospital in San Francisco. Uh, 35 over 4, uh, 0.35, and we're on about... 34 over 4, rate of 65, inspiratory time of 0.35, and we're on about 98 to 100 percent. The child weighs two and a half pounds, about average for a premature baby. Okay. To stabilize her condition, she's on very high levels of oxygen. Doctors will reduce it as soon as they dare, even so, she could be blinded. As ever smaller babies are kept alive, doctors are no longer able to restrict oxygen and avoid RLF without risking brain damage and death. For those charged with the responsibility, the decisions begin with medicine, but end with morality. What we're balancing all the time with these babies is the fact that we feel without our intervention, without our help, they would not survive. They are not babies that could be born out in the field and be left there in the elements and survive. 
if the baby should die, let's, let's say, we worry perhaps if we had been more aggressive, perhaps if we had intervened more, this baby would be alive and hopefully healthy. If we, by our medical attempts, keep a baby alive, but the child has some damage, whatever form of damage, brain damage, retroental fibroplasia, learning disabilities, then we wonder another question, which is, have we been fair in being as aggressive as we have? Would it have been better for this family, for this baby, for us not to have been as aggressive? At the same time, it is not a clear-cut decision, and I think one of the problems is, is people think that doctors have it in their power to either decide life or death, or even to decide damage or no damage. And that's giving us more power than we have. But medicine does have enormous power to intervene in natural processes. And for couples like Steve and Susan Wick, the results can be tragic. Susan was 26 weeks into her pregnancy when her waters broke. She, her husband and her gynecologist decided to let nature take its course and to make no special efforts to resuscitate the baby should it be born alive. She was not prepared for what happened when she came out of sedation. A doctor came in and woke me up and told me who he was and told me we'd had a, a baby boy and that he was alive and that they'd been working on him for hours. Um, and I just thought, uh, well, I, don't, I just thought that he was in the wrong room, that, that it was another woman in another room who'd had a baby and this was just a horrible, horrible mistake. There were three doctors and four nurses and an x-ray technician all crowded around this one little yeah. table and here's this baby about this long and they they were trying to get blood out of him with needles that looked huge they looked as big around as his arm uh, and I all I could think was and the one thing that still sticks in my head is it's just unfair you know it's just not fair did you feel it was brutal oh yeah I I did especially I know mothers who wanted their baby saved but uh, I feel like, especially since we had made the decision, that uh, that's how we feel about life, you know, and that it should have been respected. Their son, Paul, fell onto the knife edge between too much oxygen and too little. He's completely blind in his right eye, almost blind in his left, from RLF. Now his parents have been told he's partially paralyzed down his right side because at some point his brain was damaged from oxygen starvation. It's cases like this that have led Bill Silverman to question many of the decisions he made. I felt as a physician I must always come down on the side of life. I must always do everything that I can. I was trained this way. Uh, I think that's wrong. I think parents must decide whether or not to unleash this power, and this power is becoming uh, uh, greater by, by the hour, practically. I mean, the ability to keep individuals alive is now so, so great that the question, uh, which was always there, is more acute than ever. Most doctors agonize with their decisions. Oh, yes. What are the worst moments that you've had? Uh, exactly that. When I was told by a parent, Doc, don't try too hard. And I felt that I had to try as hard as I could, that I could not listen to that voice. That is the most agonizing moment uh, for me. And there were many such moments, because I was told that uh, repeatedly. So now it's the victims of RLF, the people he believes are the unfinished business of medicine, to whom Silverman devotes much of his time. I want to remind you that what we're going to do, you know, simply walk into the intensive care unit and uh, remember that you're here to get your uh, questions answered and uh, don't be the least bit bashful about this. They, they know you're coming, they're eager to, uh, to respond. He's organized this visit to the Children's Hospital of San Francisco to help Risa, Maureen, Cindy and Jim to understand why they're blind. Similar trips to other hospitals had a powerful effect on medical staff as well. This is baby Martin, a little boy. 
He's in the isolate that's right in the front of you here mm -hmm. that you can see. <gasps> you that's about yeah. two oh. and a half feet long. Oh. And uh, I guess three or four feet high off the ground. Mm -hmm. And it has um, six holes in it that we can put our hands through. Mm -hmm. yes. Feel that? Mm -hmm. Those are the bones in the back of your head, right? Yeah. Here. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. When do they start making sound? They have a tube that's down their throat now for breathing, so as long as that tube's in there, it goes past their vocal cords, we won't be able to hear them. Just incredible to see no. this, you know? I mean, you read about it, you hear about it. Can you feel his toes? Yeah. He's got his big toe, feel how he's got his big toe extend. <laughs> My darling! What are, the, what are the things on... For Cindy Morrison, who has a young son of her own, it's a doubly emotional experience. Oh, that's too precious. You know what else you feel? I'll let you explore. This is no pain. Oh, oh. It's real skinny. Oh, you precious baby. Oh, you beautiful. Jim, I want to introduce you to Matthew. He was born at 27 weeks of age, which is about six months. He's four months early. He weighs one pound and ten ounces. Now, how much did you say you weighed when Two you were Two pounds. Two I forget pounds. how many ounces. You were probably a little bit bigger than him, but not much. Mm -hmm. How do you monitor the oxygen because of the... Uh, problems that have occurred from time to time with myself and others. I'm wondering how you uh, monitor it and, and are there ways you can tell by monitoring if the eye is beginning to be affected in any way or how that is dealt with. Okay. If you fill up on the baby's chest, there's a black electrode. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's called a transcutaneous monitor. Mm -hmm. What that's doing is measuring the baby's oxygen level in his blood through his skin without having to inject the baby or anything. And I have a machine here that's giving me a number readout of what that oxygen level is. So what I do is I adjust his oxygen according to his needs. If he's crying, if he's moving around a lot, and it changes all the time. He's never just left in a certain amount of oxygen, and we really don't know right now how much oxygen hurts baby's eyes. At what point would you begin to know? After um, it's too late. Oh. Do you feel at all resentful about the care you received? Do you think at that? Times. At times. You do? It, it comes in cycles. I mean, you, when, when, you, when, you have to, when you get uh, frustrated with a lot of problems that you wouldn't have to face otherwise, mm -hmm. uh, it, it does get aggravating at times. There are other times you... A lot of it has to do with the way you're brought up, too. If, if people tell you in school, like ministers and people, that your parents were bad or something and that you're a, a curse to your family or something, that sort of makes your resentment a little more intense. Okay, Jim, now I'd like to ask you something, because I have to face daily working in a unit like this all the time with sort of life and death on the line, wondering whether, you know, it's really, if it's worth it, if it's ethically if it's ethically okay to do what I'm doing, because I do see babies that, that leave the unit that maybe aren't normal, that maybe do have some problems, and I see babies die. I, I can ask you, because you can look back, I mean, you've been there, you were this baby, you were as small as Matthew, you were in the hospital and sick for a very long time, and I can ask you to look back and tell me if, if you could do it over, would you want them to have saved you? No. Maybe. No. You say no? No, I mean, I don't know if that's the... It's... No at times. Well, I guess no. No. What would you do if you had a baby and, and the baby was Matthew's size or also a very small baby? Yeah, he was very premature. No. This is hard. No. Yeah. 
Dr. Bill Silverman, the story of RLF is a parable of modern medicine, a disorder which came from nowhere, blinded 10,000 babies, was found to be caused by a simple medical treatment, was then believed to be dead and buried, but which rose again to haunt the lives of those who thought they knew the answers. You know, it may sound incredible after spending my entire life, you know, studying this disorder, my entire medical life, I do not know the cause of retrolemal fibroplasia. It is very clear that oxygen is not the sole single cause. It plays a role in some way which simply has not been evaluated. We know only that prolonged exposure at very high concentration increases the risk, but that is all we know. And it is necessary now to mount a very, very energetic uh, uh, research effort uh, to discover uh, the causes, the multiple causes of retrolental fibroplasia, of blinding that occurs in premature infants. What are some of the lessons the doctors ought to have learned from RLF? I think the most important lesson for me has been uh, uh, the matter of uh, uh, progress from certainty uh, to uncertainty, uh, from uh, uh, conviction that I knew uh, to the clear understanding that I do not know. And uh, you know, it's summarized uh, very well uh, by uh, the statement that's attributed to Maimonides, teach thy tongue to say, I do not know, and thou shalt progress. Amen. In America, there are apparently now more than 700 babies afflicted each year by RLF. Here in Britain, the figure, mercifully, is much lower, about 30 a year. And perhaps it's worth adding, therefore, that the victims of RLF form only a tiny fraction of those babies who are given oxygen and therefore thrive. We'll be back in a moment with two more films. Welcome back. First Tuesday has brought reports from many parts of the world, but it's not all one-way traffic. Based in London and reflecting the huge world appetite for news is a small army of foreign correspondents from every corner of the earth, and their influence is immense. In Something to Write Home About, we look at some of the people who spend their lives looking at us. In recent weeks, people all over the world opened their morning newspapers to find stories about Liverpool. In Italy, they read how Liverpool, once one of the richest cities in the world, has become today a capital of European poverty. In East Berlin, a cultural communique said that Liverpool's visiting card had been stamped forever with unemployment and decline. In Boston, Massachusetts, readers were told that someone had murdered Liverpool and gotten away with it. With the thermometer of Liverpool, they read in Rome, you can measure the fever of Britain. This film is about what happened when foreign journalists came to take the temperature this spring. In 1940, the temperature was hot. The world saw Britain through the eyes of adventurous foreign correspondents, men like the American, Ed Murrow. Murrow dressed like Bogart and wrote like Hemingway. 
In the public mind, he created a lasting image of how correspondents chase the big story. But to the world, he reported a powerful and flattering view of Britain with its back to the wall. Look at those faces. People who sing like that in times like these cannot be beaten. For these people have the power to hit back. And they're going to hit back with all the skill of their hands, the proud traditions of their craft, and the fire in their hearts. Murrow's reports helped to shape the way the world saw Britain for a generation. But it was an American view from the black and white world of 1940. In 1984, different eyes look out on a different Britain. This is no longer Ed Murrow's London, and few of her neighbours in the Barbican flats would suppose that Mrs Liang Li Zhuan was a foreign correspondent. Her newspaper, the Peking People's Daily, is one of the biggest in the world, but Mrs Liang has few of the facilities most Western journalists would take for granted. Her copy is written by hand, and, unless terribly urgent, delivered to China by post. We cannot have longer articles, is it? Usually, this is the space we can have. Yes. We have a small um, picture with Big Ben. It's the symbol of articles from London. I brought a copy, it's there on the table, of our most popular paper, which is oh. The Sun. I thought you might like to compare that with yours, as yours is probably the most read paper, isn't it, the People's Daily? I think it's better compared with the Times, because totally different. I just cannot <laughs> make any comparisons <laughs> between the two. <laughs> even our uh, record, is a you call it popular paper, we have evening paper, but not like that sun. Uh, not so sen sensational topics <laughs> and those terrible page three. <laughs> During the Cultural Revolution, Mrs Liang and her colleagues were exiled to the countryside to raise pigs. Her assignment to London is proof of her rehabilitation. Do you think coming from a socialist country helps you understand the situation here? No. I think because I'm not very young, I have been in the old society we call it, before liberation. That's why I can understand things very easily. We have gambling before liberation. We have post prostitutes. <laughs> and we have, as a very wealthy people and very poor people. Is it such things no more in China? Here, you, you can see the homeless people sleeping under the bridge in an embank embankment. And not far away are the very high-class hotels. People can spend a lot of money one evening. Such things happened in China before, but not now. <laughs> Italian journalism has a different style. Since I'm a girl in the news, I already covered the yesterday news. After 20 years of reporting from London, the English way of life has few greater admirers than Count Paolo Filo della Torre. The English system of election is much cleaner. The first past the post, and that is the end of the story. It's another country. In Italy, we have the story of buying the votes because of the preferential votes on the banks. It's not honest because no, the I'm mafia sure. is involved. Count Paolo writes for La Repubblica, a respectably left of center paper published in Rome. But his reputation as a man about town has been built in that charmed square mile between the Ritz Hotel and Westminster. How are you today? Thank you. Nice to see you. Thank you very much. Hello. I like the English way of living, but one can have the English way of living being a foreigner. I mean, it's um, nothing that uh, would prevent uh, an Italian from. Uh, enjoying lots of uh, British uh, goods. Paolo Filo della Torre came from a landowning family. His ancestors include a cardinal, a general, and two saints, one on his father's side, the other on his mother's. 
In what he describes as a passing phase, Count Paolo was once a candidate for Italy's monarchist party. The experience left him with an insight into leadership. His book on Mrs Thatcher is called The Iron Baby Doll. Mrs Thatcher is uh, very much a star abroad because, you see, she's so English. I mean, um, you wouldn't imagine um, an Italian Mamma Thatcher like that. You wouldn't imagine a Frau Thatcher. You, uh, you can only imagine an English lady like that. And uh, because uh, she's so English, it's, again, one of the great points of our favor. You know, you had in the 60s very much the swing in London, uh, the mini skirts, the new uh, Chelsea, all that sort of thing. And um, the Beatles. Now we are going with Mrs. Thatcher, again, rediscovering all the old Britain. And this is why I find that it's very interesting to see how many foreigners, they come to Britain and follow some sort of a, a touch of pilgrimage, and they love to see the places that are very much associated with Thatcher's Britain. Not so many pilgrims in this plane flying into Liverpool, but 22 working journalists from all over the world. Marxists, capitalists, Christians, Jews, seeking the truth with notebooks and overnight bags on behalf of nearly 100 million readers. For the British government who are sponsoring the tour, it's a chance to sell Britain. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Merseyside. You may feel, as you arrived at the airport, um, that, is where the Be that is where the Beatles arrived on the 10th of July, 1964. They had a little bit better reception than you did because a quarter of a million people came out to greet them. Because they were turning away from the city centre, but I'm taking it this way so that I can point out a couple of areas in which the Beatles lived. Uh, you mentioned uh, McCartney and John Lennon. What about George Harrison and uh, Ringo Starr's first home? Yes. Do we, are we going to pass them by? Driving on the edge of Toxton, I'm sure you all heard about the riots that we had here some three years ago. I'd like to impress on you that it wasn't the whole of Merseyside that was affected. It was contained in literally one square mile, just over behind the buildings on our right-hand side. Steve Erlanger, Boston Globe. Liverpool is pushing the Beatles with a sort of desperation. Ringo's mother and stepfather are still alive, living in Liverpool. His father is dead. The house behind you has another interesting feature. It's just been renovated. And in this house, this number 10... Ringo's go papa's ghost has just gone in. <laughs> Gaia Salvadio, La Stampa. If Salzburg had as many monuments to Mozart, there'd be no room to park your car. And in 1940, when he was born, the rent here... Just, just, the rent was 14 shillings and ten pence. Hong Kong. Hard hit Liverpool is trusting its future to Beatlemania. So if you were to translate it in London terms, where would it be? Hampstead or... No, no. East End. East End. It's more than the East End. Actually, we're south end. South. south of the city. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think the Beatles would have been heroes in China the way they're heroes here? I think you see, he, take, he took drugs and his private life with those new photographs. I don't think such people can become heroes in China. Do you think people would write about them in newspapers in China? I'm considered whether I will write or not. Perhaps from my angle. <laughs> oh yes, it is a story, definitely. Uh, people are interested in the Beatles. Uh, so. 
there's no doubt uh, it was such a myth in the 60s and it's impossible to die so quickly. In the very beginning I think they are uh, good because they charge very few money, only five um, shillings, I think. Uh, and they, they say, have a connection with the working people, they perform for them and they encourage people in a depressed city. I think it's good at the beginning days. But then and 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 then by and by they change. They become they became millionaire. They left the city and never returned. They forgot it. The journalist tour continues into the heart of Liverpool's old dockland. In their heyday, when these giant warehouses stood at the crossroads of the old world and the new, Liverpool's trade rivaled London and New York. Now the docks are being rebuilt as deluxe apartments and restaurants. The likelihood is that the fathers of these men made their living from the sea, but nothing took root once the shipping had gone. Now, piece by piece, they rebuild their own past as a tourist attraction. gentlemen, once again, we'd like you to uh, greet our international press from very different countries in the world, East Germany, Italy, Republic of China, all different levels of international press people. We welcome to these two these rooms in St. Patrick's. We've got no choice, and the first question you ask, what happens if you fail? And the answer I'll tell you is that we can't afford to fail. We can't afford to fail. We're fed up with being kicked in the teeth. There are problems in this city, and that the problems are not going to be solved by garden festivals, by doing the Albert Dock Up, but by investing hard cash. Jerry McDonough. Jared. Jared McDonough and John Fulverty. Campolo of Italy, gentlemen. Liverpool once, I was on the lorries years ago in on a vehicle uh, delivering to the docks. And sometimes you could wait for two days just to get into the docks and you deliver your load. But now you can go down the docks and you go in and out of each dock. There's nothing going on, you know. It's so sad the port's gone right down, you know. It used to be so busy once upon a time. And you wonder where all the trade has gone to, you know. Or whether it's... The Liverpool people's fault or, or just the way the world is, I don't know. The next day, the voice of the people is replaced once again by the authentic voice of the PR man. 
It's a festival show, it's a magnificent show for six months, but in the long term we'll have a place where people can work because there will be industrial units here, a place where people can live because all of this will become housing, and a place where people can enjoy their leisure time. This magnificent parkland with the pub, the promenade and the leisure complex. The time for selling is over. Liverpool has put its best face forward, but now it's the turn of the journalists to write their side of the story. In Italy, I would say, I would put in headline, uh, Liverpool like Naples. In both towns, you see so many people unemployed, uh, so, so, my, so many problems, a little bit of squalor, things that they definitely need to be improved. Yes, we Chinese in New Liverpool, the famous old city. For such a long time, uh, the shipping, so, so many things in the past. And I think it will be interesting how they revitalize such an old city. And really, they have difficulties. You see, the people I met last night, they said uh, there are many difficulties, they said. But they love this city. This is a very strong one. You love it, and you want to do something for it. You talk to people at the same time, and you see a lot, a lot of will of people to try to do things, to get things better. Uh, they've got a lot of imagination, and they've got a, a very strong will of work. And they have a very, very strong will of uh, getting things done. Uh, I should tell them the problems, but I don't want to uh, uh, say anything hopeless. If the people here, they have their hope. I cannot say they are hopeless. With the thermometer of Liverpool, you can measure the temperature of Britain. The journalists came and made the familiar diagnosis of vanished prosperity and faded empire. For a hundred million readers, this was the news this spring. But for Liverpool, it's an old, old story. Nothing to write home about. the Dockland city of Liverpool. And from there we go to the gangland city of Chicago, but not for the hoods. We meet instead a 77-year-old with a remarkable story to tell. Joan Williams, the subject of Where Did You Get That Woman, has traveled a long road to her present job as a washroom attendant in a glamorous disco. Seventy-seven years old. I never dreamed that I would be working at this age, but I do very well for an old bag. Having a job is really beautiful. It just makes me happy. I've been doing this kind of work for the past 20 years. I worked at some of the best places here in Chicago. <laughs> It's a rough job at times. They're not going to give you a quarter just to be in there. So you have to talk to them and tell them how pretty they look and, well, where'd you get such a lovely gown? And, oh, isn't that gorgeous? Oh, you look so beautiful. You cut your hair, I know. <laughs> talk like that, that's about the only way you can make it, honey. Some people don't think I'm nothing, but others go out to the bar and say, where did you get that woman? And they're not very clean ladies, I've found, over the years. I don't know where they came from, but all I know is they sure not used to a nice place like that. I talked to one old lady, it tickled the hell out of me. I says, good evening. She said, don't you dare act like you know me. I'd like to die to that woman told me that. But I didn't care who she was, I was just trying to make a white quarter, you know. Don't you dare act like you know me.
I don't get paid for any of the work I do up there. All they pay is the cab fare home. The women that come and use my towels, I pay for those towels. But they, some of them come and use them, and they won't to give you anything. But you're a loser, you know. If it was possible to live my life over again, it would be different. Well, I had lost my mother when I was 12, and I had three brothers to help support, so I went to work for a dollar a week. And I had nobody to come put their arms around me and say, you poor baby, or nothing like that. Even when I got back from the funeral, they were saying, gal, get away from that wall and come on here and help wash the dishes. Your mother's gone now. I was living in Norwalk, Oklahoma, and I was working for Mrs. Fretwell. And that first day I went to work, I didn't look very good because what do I know about working or cleaning up? And she took one of her dresses and hemmed it up for me and washed my face and brushed my hair. And she said, don't you ever come to work dirty like that again. So I took it from there. And then my father remarried and he moved to Bayan, Oklahoma, to the cotton patch. We lived right in the middle of a cotton patch in Bayan. And I couldn't ever pick cotton very good. I wanted to go back up to New Water and work for Mrs. Fretwell, but he wouldn't let me. I wanted to mail her a letter, and he said no, my father. But I mailed it anyhow. So then when I got back from mailing it, he had set my trunk out. And he wouldn't let me stay all night there. I was 13 by this time. He went and got me a ticket up to No Water, Oklahoma. And he left my brothers there to watch me till time come for me to get on the train. And he gave me 50 cents. And that's how I came out in this great big world, on my own. And I met Major Williams. I was 13 and he was about 15. He was two years older than me. So for about two years, we went together. Then I got pregnant. And he said he'd marry me if I got pregnant. We got married on a Wednesday. And, and we laughed that whole damn day. I have never seen people get married and laugh like we did. He says, God damn it, you my wife. I said, God damn it, you my husband. When Margie was born, I was 16. And Harold, I was 21. And Sonny, I was 22. We all was just a bunch of kids. Hot time, hot time, we got hot time now. At that time, you could hardly make it. We was in soup lines and bread lines and uh, bean lines in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Just think and think about it, we got hot time Years ago, you used to go knock on the doors of the rich people and say, would you like to have a maid? This woman hired me for the week, and uh, I couldn't eat nothing with her. I couldn't eat her food very good because my children was hungry. They couldn't eat until I got back that night. So you can imagine what was going around in my brain. This lady and her husband was peeking through the keyhole while I was taking bread and butter. So when, they got ready, when I got ready to go home, they said, we saw you taking bread and butter. I said, someone hungry? I said, yes, my three children are hungry. So she said, uh, well, we aren't going to charge you for the bread. You could just have that, but don't come back. What could I say? You know, I, I must have been down and out and very sad for that to go through. But my children had to have something to eat. And my husband was lazy as they come. Did you ever fall in love with a man that was no good? Well, I caught him in bed with women. He tried to be a swinger, you know. Did you ever fall in love with a man that is no good? He got killed at this little town, Chicago, Oklahoma. 
Two policemen shot him eight times. It was a rebel town, for one thing. They didn't like black people. But he had been drinking. And he was impossible when he was drinking. And I didn't have no insurance or nothing. He had insurance, but the way he was killed, I couldn't get a dime while resisting a police officer or being intoxicated, you know? Crying, hey, baby, don't you want to go? Lot of California, sweet home, Chicago. I sure thank myself for coming to Chicago. I'm going to tell you something that you all should know. Chicago is the best place I ever know. I'm going to stay in this town. I'm going to live in this town. I'm going to live in Chicago. It's the greatest place around. During the war, I worked in the war plant, 1943 to 1945. On the night then when we lost our president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, well, I was up under one of those big C-54s shooting rivets. I used to work at Manny Scar's the Harry Inn. There was always a celebrity there, like uh, Frank Sinatra and his wife. You know, Frankie is a star. He really tips. He gave the bartenders $100 each. $50 to the waitresses and 25 to the bus boys. So you see, he don't care about money, but there's no one else in the world like Frank Sinatra as far as being generous. I've had a lot of happiness with stars, people in show business. I always call myself, I'm in show business. I couldn't ever get a husband that would stay with me. I just couldn't get nobody to get out there and say, well, come on, baby, let's get it together here. And let's, you bring your money in, and I'll bring mine in, and let's get somewhere. I couldn't ever get no guy like that. A lot of people don't know what it's like to be lonely. When you have a family, they all grow up and get away from you and you don't have a husband, well, you, you really can get pretty lonesome. This place, if I was able to pay a rent, I would have been out of this place. There's no pleasure here. I'm very grateful for the job. I really am. Because it gives me something to look forward to. If I didn't have nothing, I would really be messed up. I like her. Joan Williams, the subject of that American film. That's all for tonight. The next first Tuesday is the first Tuesday in September. Hope you'll join us then. Good night. <laughs> <laughs>